Hello, everyone. This is Al-Fadi, and I'd like to welcome you back to another episode of this series on the Doctrine of the Trinity from the Old Testament. Uh, today, we are going to continue with our discussion concerning uh, the persons of the Trinity. And with me here, of course, in studio is Anthony Rogers. And Anthony, if I recall, today we're going to continue with the Angel of the Lord discussion. Yes and how the angel of the Lord, as presented to us in the passages we're going to see, have divine prerogatives. Right, right. So last time we saw that Moses encountered the angel of the Lord at the burning bush. So there was an awesome sight that draw, drew Moses' attention, and, right. and so we have that whole interaction there. But one of the things that the angel of the Lord said to Moses on that occasion is, this is going to be a sign to you, you're going to worship at this mountain meaning after you've been delivered out of Egypt. And that's exactly where we're at, right? The angel of the Lord has now accomplished Israel's deliverance through the Red Sea. So a lot of time has elapsed, but they're now at the foot of Mount Sinai, right? And right. so when we, we pick up the story in Exodus 24, we have this interesting statement. In context, it's the Lord who's speaking. Right. Okay, I put that in brackets, but you can go back and you can see in context that's, that's who's speaking. And it says, then he, that is the Lord, he's the one referred to by the pronoun, then he said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and you shall worship at a distance. Moses alone, however, shall come near to the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people come up with him. And so the, the idea is that they're at the mountain, Moses is summoned up the mountain with three others, but they can only go so far. Moses alone can go the rest of the distance and actually uh, be right there in the presence of the Lord. But what's significant here, and this is something that even later Jews had some difficulty with, you'll notice that Moses is told to come up to the Lord, but the one who told him to do that is the Lord. And so the question is, and this is the question post-Christian Jews were asking, earlier Jews had no trouble with this because they didn't reject what the Old Testament says about God being multipersonal. But later Jews are looking at this, and you see this in the Talmud. They're saying, why does the Lord say, come up to the Lord and not come up to me? Right. Shouldn't, I mean, shouldn't he just say, come to me? Instead, he's acting as though the Lord is another person. And the answer to it is actually found in the previous context. So if we go to the... Uh, well, the next slide actually tells us, this is a little bit later in 24, I just want to make sure people know here that the one who's there, that Moses is going to is God, the God of Israel. Correct. Right. You see that in verse 9 and 10. Then Moses went up with Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. Later in the same verse, they saw God. So there's no question that Moses is going up to God, right? But when we move back in the previous chapter in our next slide, we learn why God speaks this way and why it makes sense. And it's not that he isn't speaking to a different person. He is speaking to a different person. But listen to what it says in Exodus 23. Behold, I am going to send an angel before you to guard you along the way and bring you to the place which I have prepared. Now, remembering our previous discussion, the word angel doesn't tell us anything other than this is a messenger of some sort. He's, right. he's coming for some purpose, but we don't know whether it's a human being, just from the word, or if it's one of the an angelic creature, or if it's a divine person. And it quickly becomes apparent who this is from the rest of the context. It says, Behold, I'm going to send an angel before you to guard you along the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Be on your guard before him and obey his voice. And this, this is a beautiful expression. Uh, it should perk our ears. Uh, and actually, the English isn't always the, the best here, but uh, another way of putting it in English is listen to him. Okay? God is telling the people of Israel, listen to this person. Right? And here's why. Do not be rebellious toward him for or because he will not pardon your transgression. Right. Now, that's huge. God is saying you have to listen to this one. Don't rebel against him. If you do, he's got the prerogative to punish you for your sin and not forgive you. Right? This already assumes that he's a divine person. And that's what it goes on to say, isn't it? It says, since right. my name is in him. Yes, and, and the name, of course, the concept of name, I, I always like to tell people this, 
my authority is in him, my power is in him, my right. nature is in him. Right. And so uh, in, in Joshua 24, verses 19 through 21, we actually see that this is a way of talking about God, right? In, in Joshua 24, it says, then Joshua said to the people, you'll not be able to serve the Lord. He's basically giving them a, a grim prediction. He's saying, you guys are too rebellious. You're not going to be able to serve him. And then he says, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. It's the same statement that's made about the angel. If you rebel against this one, he's going to judge you for it. Right. And uh, Joshua says that about the Lord. And so uh, as uh, we go along in Scripture, we're not surprised then when we get to a place like Zechariah 3 and we see that very thing. We see the angel exercising the prerogative of forgiving sins. Uh, here in Joshua 3, this is a great story because really this is a picture of all of us, right? Uh, here you have the picture of somebody who's filthy standing before the Lord, and the Lord's going to cleanse him and forgive right. him. And uh, so it says, Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. So here's Joshua. He's standing before the angel. So the angel, is, this is in heaven, right? This, the angel is presented as presiding. Right? And, and, and Joshua is being presented before him, but Satan is there accusing him. It's like a courtroom scene. And this is Joshua the priest, by the, the way. The high priest, yeah. yeah. And then it says, uh, the Lord said to Satan, now wait a minute, right? The, the persons in view are who? It's the angel of the Lord, Joshua the high priest, and Satan is there to accuse Joshua. But now we read suddenly it says, the Lord said to Satan. But look at, look at what the Lord says, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not, this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and standing before the angel. And so you see that the, there's this interchange. The, right. on, on the one hand, the one that they're standing before is called the angel. On the other hand, he's called the Lord. And then when he speaks, he speaks about the Lord. He says, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Right. And so when you go on to the next verses, verses 4 and 5, Notice what he does. It says, he spoke and said to those who were standing before him, saying, remove the filthy garments from him. Again, he said to him, see, I have taken away your iniquity. I've taken your iniquity away from you and will clothe you with festal robes. Then I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments while the angel of the Lord was standing by. And so here, again, we have a clear glimpse of the angel of the Lord being called Lord, being right. called Yahweh, exercising the prerogative of forgiving sins. In this case, happily, he's exercising that prerogative, whereas earlier in Exodus, God says he's not going to, to let you get away with rebellion You know, as he's leading you into the land. You must obey him. You must follow him. You must listen to him. And so that brings us back then to Exodus 24, verses right. 1 and 2. Which we see right here. Yeah, which explains why God says, come up to the Lord instead of come up to me. Because there's another person there. Now, you remember, and this is where I say it's like, it's, it's really good. Uh, you remember I said earlier, I, I drew attention to the fact that God said to, about the angel that's going to lead them into the land, listen to him. When you realize now, here they are up on this mountain, and there's two divine persons, one of, uh, one of whom says of the other, listen to him, right? And Moses is present. Does that make you think of anything? It should make everybody, all the listeners, think of the Mount of Transfiguration. Right. You remember what happens? Exactly. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Listen to him. And who's present on the mountain? Our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and Moses. Moses was there. Right. Moses appears there together with Elijah, who's another person who encountered the angel of the Lord on Mount Sinai. So that's the reason Moses and Elijah are both there. There are two figures who encountered the angel on, on the mountain. And just like God said to Moses on the occasion in Exodus 24 and 23, listen to him. So God the Father comes and he says to uh, everyone, uh, listen to him. Right. So it's, it's, a, it's a repeat, if you will. And remember, Moses took three people with him, right? Uh, Nadab, uh, Nadab and Abihu uh, and Aaron. Well, Moses, or likewise in, in Mark 9, when you have the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus takes three people with him, uh, Peter, James, and John. That's right. 
So it's a repeat. It's, it's uh, you know, when, when Moses and Elijah see God on the mountain, they say, we've done all this before. <laughs> That's right. That's mm. right. But it's kind of interesting because it's almost like Scripture interprets Scripture and as if the Lord is bringing the, the rem- to the remembrance of those who were there this incident that you just mentioned, you know, because they're, they're Jewish people. They would have studied it. They probably memorized part of it. And they would recall, you know, some of the verbiage here and obviously – uh, it's powerful, and for us to learn that there is a correlation that is taking place between the Old Testament and New Testament as well. Right. Excellent. Excellent, as always. Thank you so much. Uh, this concludes, by the way, this episode, and uh, we will continue, of course, with uh, our you know deep dive here into the Scripture from the Old Testament to uh, explore what does the Word of God teach in the Old Testament, out of all places, of course, concerning the doctrine of the Trinity. Until we meet again. Have a blessed day. Thank you for watching. Please like our video and we encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Sierra International. And be sure also to click the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we upload new videos into the channel. And finally, I like to prayerfully encourage you to become a patron through Patreon. Your giving is much needed and it will enable us to produce more and more of videos like this so that we can publish them on a weekly basis. So thank you in advance.